something that he traditionally did every Christmas uh, in his years on radio called, uh, what is it, the story of Michael, a letter from Michael? A letter from Michael. A letter from Michael. Go ahead and tell us about it and how it came about, would you please? Well, it started in uh, 1960, Mark, at uh, the old old WKMH uh, out in Dearborn. On uh, a couple of days before Christmas, I was looking for something unusual to do at Christmas time. Mm Mm-hmm. I had uh, pre-recorded the true story of Christmas, but I was looking for something unusual, and the news director there said, I've got something for you, and he opened up his briefcase and pulled out this old, rumpled piece of paper. He said, you read that on Christmas Eve. What it was was a copy of a letter written by a young Marine to his mother while he was hospitalized after being wounded on a Korean battlefield in 1950. And it came into the hands of a Navy chaplain. The Navy chaplain read this letter before 5,000 Marines at the San Diego Naval Base in 1951, and then it found its way into this news director's hands. But the Navy chaplain talked with the boy, and he talked with the boy's mother and the members of the patrol and the sergeant in charge of the patrol, and privately, Navy chaplain Captain Father Walter Mulder, and he might be listening now with the power of your radio station, and Michael himself might be listening now because I've talked with him. Really? Privately, the good father will tell you that it's a true story. So what we did was start to read the uh, story on the Christmas Eve of 1960 and did it for eight years uh, in Detroit. And what we say at Christmas time is we read the letter and let it stand on its own merits. And this story is the letter, a copy of the original letter from a Marine named Michael about what happened to him on a Korean battlefield in 1950. Okay, we all ready to hear it? All right. All right, let's hear it right now. Dear Mom, I wouldn't dare write this letter to anyone but you because no one else would believe it. Maybe even you'll find it hard. But I've got to tell somebody. First off, I'm in a hospital. Now, don't worry. You hear me? Don't worry. I was wounded, but I'm okay. You understand? Okay. The doctor says I'll be up and around in a month. But that isn't what I want to tell you. Remember when I joined the Marines last year? Remember when I left how you told me to say a prayer to St. Michael every day? You really didn't have to tell me that. Ever since I can remember, you always told me to pray to St. Michael the Archangel. You even named me after him. Well, I always have. When I got to Korea, I prayed even harder. Remember the prayer you taught me? Michael, Michael of the morning, fresh cord of heaven adorning. You know the rest of it. Well, I said it every day. Sometimes when I was marching or sometimes resting, but always before I went to sleep. I even got some of the other fellows to say it. Well, one day I was with an advanced detail way up forward to the front lines. We were scouting for the commies. I was plodding along in the bitter cold. My breath was like cigar smoke. I thought I knew every guy in a patrol when alongside of me comes another Marine I'd never met before. He was bigger than any Marine I'd ever seen. He must have been six foot four and built in proportion. It gave me a feeling of security to have such a buddy near. Anyway, there we were, trudging along. The rest of the patrol spread out. Just to start a conversation, I said, Cold, ain't it? And then I laughed. Here I was with a good chance of getting killed any minute. And I'm talking about the weather. My companion seemed to understand. I heard him laugh softly. I looked at him. I've never seen you before. I thought I knew every man in the outfit. I just joined at the last minute, he replied. The name is Michael. That's so, I said, surprised. That's my name, too. I know, he said, and then went on, Michael, Michael of the morning. I was too amazed to say anything for a minute. How did he know my name in a prayer that you had taught me? And then I smiled to myself. Every guy in the outfit knew about me. Hadn't I taught the prayer to anybody to listen? By now and then, they even referred to me as St. Michael. Neither of us spoke for a time. And then, he broke the silence. We're going to have some trouble up ahead. He must have been in fine physical shape, for he was breathing so lightly I couldn't see his breath. Mine poured out in great clouds. There was no smile on his face now. Trouble ahead, I thought to myself. Well, with the commies all around us, that's no great revelation. 
snow began to fall in great thick globs. In a brief moment, the whole countryside was blotted out. And I was marching in a white fog of wet, sticky particles. My companion disappeared. Michael! I shouted in sudden alarm. I felt his hand on my arm. His voice was rich and strong. This will stop shortly. His prophecy proved to be correct. In a few minutes, the snow stopped as abruptly as it had begun. The sun was a hard, shining disk. I looked back for the rest of the patrol. There was no one in sight. We lost him in that heavy fall of snow. I looked ahead as we came over a little rise. Mom, my heart stopped. There were seven of them. Seven commies in their padded pants and jackets and their funny hats. Only there wasn't anything funny about them now. Seven rifles were aimed at us. Down, Michael! I screamed and hit the frozen earth. I heard those rifles fire almost as one. I heard the bullets. There was Michael. Still standing. Mom, those guys couldn't have missed. Not at that range. I expected to see him literally blown to bits. But there he stood. Making no effort to fire himself. He was paralyzed with fear. It happens sometimes, Mom. Even to the bravest. He was... He, he was like a bird. Fascinated by a snake. At least that's what I thought then. I jumped up to pull him down. And that's when I got mine. I felt a sudden flame in my chest. I often wondered what it felt like to be hit. Now, I know... I remember feeling strong arms about me. Arms that laid me ever so gently on a pillow of snow. I opened my eyes for one last look. I was dying. Maybe I was even dead. I remember thinking, well, this isn't so bad. Maybe I was looking into the sun. Maybe I was in shock. But it seemed I saw Michael standing erect again. Only this time his face was shining with a terrible splendor. As I say, maybe it was the sun in my eyes, but he seemed to change as I watched him. He grew bigger. His arms stretched out wide. Maybe it was the snow falling again, but there was a brightness around him, like the wings of an angel. In his hand was a sword, a sword that flashed with a million lights. Well, that's the last thing I remember till the rest of the fellows came up and found me. I don't know how much time had passed, but now and then I had a moment's respite from the pain and fever. I remember telling them of the enemy just ahead. Where's Michael? I asked. I saw them look at one another. Where's who? Asked one. Michael. Michael, that big Marine I was walking with just before the snow squall hit us. Kid, said the sergeant, you weren't walking with anyone. I had my eyes on you the whole time. You were getting too far out. I was just going to call you in when you disappeared in the snow. He looked at me, curiously. How'd you do it, kid? How'd I do what? I asked, half angry despite my wound. This Marine named Michael and I were just... Son, said the sergeant kindly. I picked this outfit myself. And there just ain't another Michael in it. You're the only Mike in it. He paused for a minute. Just how'd you do it, kid? We heard shots. There hasn't been a shot fired from your rifle. And there isn't a bit of lead in them seven bodies over the hill there. I didn't say anything. What could I say? I could only look, open-mouthed, with amazement. It was 
with them, the sergeant spoke again. Kid, he said gently. Every one of those seven commies over the hill there was killed by a sword stroke. That's all I can tell you, Mom. As I say, it may have been the sun in my eyes. It may have been the cold or the pain. But that's what happened. Love. Michael. people who've written me over the years and uh, wanted to know is it still possible ever to hear the story of Michael or a letter from Michael. I call it the wrong thing, I guess. Yeah. Uh, I hope they'll be pleased. We've told them now for the last month that you'd be on and doing it. You ain't gonna get this copy back. Michael lives in Indiana. I think Does he really? Listening. Yes. Really? Yeah. Lives I'm in Indiana. Indiana. Yes, he does. Oh, that's great. Okay. I'd like very much to hear from him. I really would. Well, uh, maybe we can arrange that. Okay. I'll see if I can reach him. I haven't talked with him in a couple of years. All right. He'll tell you it's true, though. Well, a lot of people have wanted to hear it over the years, and there it is. And I'm just going to hang on to the tape now. Do I have your permission to play it at will every year? Anytime. <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> okay, Lee, thanks again, and Merry Christmas. Thank you, Merry Christmas. Lee Allen, ladies and gentlemen.